Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think we'll now go ahead with the actual panel discussion. Uh, it's an honor to have the uh, the panelists uh, on board, as introduced by Dr. Poonam Patil, and also to an honor to have uh, Professor Peter Hillman as part of this uh, panel. The idea is to just put up a few cases and use this as as a platform to kind of bring up more questions and actually discuss what we would do, uh, uh, which is kind of more relevant to the Indian scenario and our practice. Uh, so I'll start with the first case, which is uh, directed to Dr. Satish uh, from Columbia, Asia. If you can change the next slide, please. Yeah, so basically, uh, these are management-related questions. So we have a 70-year-old male uh, diagnosed with BCLL, uh, came in with counts of hemoglobin of 10, total count of 46,000, plated of 95,000. He has generalized lymphadenopathy, cervical, axillary, inguinal region. Fish shows trisomy 21. So I was just trying to highlight the point and actually ask the question whether, you know, we are doing this routinely. Now in India, I think most people do fish and they also now have started ordering for the IGVH mutation. So as we discuss, we'll come to that. So if you look at comorbidities, that's another issue. We tend to have more elderly patients. So they could have had a CABG. In this particular case, he has hypertension, hyperlipidemia and BPH. He was started on chemoimmunotherapy, and for this case, we will consider that as bendamustine rituximab, which is the commonest used in our setup. Uh, one year later, he has clinically meaningful improvement. In the meantime, he takes another opinion, meets a few other hematologists, and now he has another FISH report, which is showing deletion 17p positive. Next slide. So the questions are, Next, the first question. So to Dr. Satish, how will you manage the patient now? And what are your thoughts on looking at BTK at this point in time? Or do you want to wait and watch Dr. Satish? Thank you, Dr. Sharath. Thank you, Poonam Madam, for the kind introduction. So Dr. Sharath, uh, this patient, uh, though we didn't know that he had deletion 17P uh, in the initial uh, setting. So he has been treated with BR, which is the common regimen we use uh, for CL in most of our patients before we were using IGH mutation and uh, uh, TP53 mutation analysis. Uh, usually, fish comes negative for deletion 17P. We used to start most of the patients on BR. So this patient, uh, though he has later been detected to have 17P deletion, because he has achieved a meaningful remission, I assume by response criteria, uh, if he has achieved at least a partial remission, if his, uh, his CBC is good and he doesn't have any symptoms, I would uh, manage him just by close observation. I will... Uh, follow up uh, closely every three months. So because we know that even 17P deletion patients, suppose uh, uh, they are uh, de detected de novo, th without any treatment, they can closely observe for at least two to three years. Only 50% of them need treatment at the end of three years. So even though this patient has had an indication initially treated with PR, now if he's in meaningful uh, remission, I think I would just closely observe him and wait till progression. And then when he does progress, what would you consider, Sadish? Definitely, my choice would be BTK inhibitor uh, or venetoclax because it's seen that uh, in patients with 17P deletion, because venetoclax has been approved for a finite therapy for 17P deletion and TP53 mutation patients. If you use venetoclax uh, based therapy, we have to stop at one to two years and many of them progress. So I would prefer an indefinite therapy with ibrutinib slash ecalabrutinib uh, when he progresses, uh, Sharath. Coming to the choice of ibrutinib versus ecalabrutinib, if his hypertension is well controlled, if his echo is normal, if his ECG doesn't show any changes, then I would prefer uh, ibrutinib also. But yes, if his hypertension is not well controlled, I would definitely prefer ecalabrutinib over ibrutinib. Okay, we'll go on to Dr. Peter Hillman for his thoughts on this case before I put him in uh, some more questions. Dr. Peter, your thoughts on this particular patient? Thank you, Sharat. Uh, I agree in terms of uh, observation. I mean, it's sometimes a challenge when patients get their fish done, uh, not when treatment is not required, because it just creates more stress for everybody involved, including the patient. So uh, that's a challenge. But um, he must have had a, fair, a reasonable amount of disease there to get a 17p result. So, so it's likely he won't be in remission for too long, but I wouldn't treat him until he needed treatment conventionally. Um, I also agree that... Um, uh, I would prefer a continuous therapy and someone with a proven 17p deletion. We would also do TP53 mutation analysis with next generation sequencing. I think that's there are a small proportion of patients uh, who will be mutated and not deleted. And so it's important to remember that if chemotherapy is still an option, 
in your community or generally. Um, I would slightly differ that uh, I think in someone because he's had a priority bypass draft before, he's hypertensive, he's clearly got cardiac issues, even if it's well controlled. And and I am anxious over the over uh, ibrutinib in that in that setting. Um, I would speak to the patient, obviously, um, and I would. I think that I would probably favour a carbutamol in that in that patient with proven cardiac um, abnormalities previously. You could also make a case for venetoclax because of the cardiac abnormalities, but I think, and certainly before we had a calor available, that might have swayed you towards a ven-based regime. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the only difference. Okay, so just a thought on this, Dr. Peter. You know, so when somebody's undergone a CABG. Uh, they would definitely be on antiplatelets, mm. certainly on one for sure. Uh, some Sometimes, you know, if they're just coming off straight away post uh, procedure, they would be on dual antiplatelets. So what is your thought when you have to introduce a BTK inhibitor if they're already on an antiplatelet? Would you take that off totally or would you kind of cut down dose? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, so we, it's that, that we've had some quite interesting conversations with the cardiologists in this setting uh, who are very are very um, keen on double platelet, antiplatelet therapy, certainly post stents, for example, or soon after a stent. Right. Um, our experience of using aspirin plus ibrutinib or acarbutinib is, is generally fine. They will bruise a bit more, but but it's 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 certainly a patient who's on aspirin for good reason. I would continue the aspirin uh, with the introduction of BTK inhibitor. Uh, if they're on, on a double antiplatelet drug plus a BTK inhibitor, that's more of a concern because these patients really do. Uh, bleed and bruise quite badly. So I'm very anxious about, about the clubidacol plus aspirin plus a BTK inhibitor of any type. Um, and in the patients that we've had, we've had one or two like that who've had a stent usually put in and, and they need a dual platelet, antiplatelet therapy for a month minimum, maybe three months, we've generally left the BTK until they've been able to go down to a single antiplatelet drug and then added the BTK with a bit of negotiation with the cardiologist um, as to as to what, how quickly we can get them off the BTK, the, the, sorry, the, the double plated antiplatelet therapy. Often in that setting, the patient's been on a BTK for a period of time and is in a good remission. And, and we know from ECOG and trial and from other experience that if you're in a good, if a patient's in a good remission from a BTK inhibitor and they stop for toxicity, it's an average of an ECOG or almost two years before they progress. So you have got some time to play with if a patient's in a good remission. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughts, Dr. Peter. We will now move on to the second case, and uh, this is addressed to Dr. Malikarjun. Uh, so this is a 54-year-old male, uh, diagnosed BCLL, a very active citizen, runs a marathon, I think just like Malikarjun. Uh, hemoglobin is 12, total count 36,000, platelet of 1,80,000. Uh, significant lymphadenopathy, he's got a beta 2M of 3, mildly elevated. His marrow shows 80% lymphocytes, uh, the diffuse pattern described on the biopsy. He is IGHV mutated and he's deletion 17P positive. Next slide. So questions to Dr. Malik first. How will you manage this patient? And the subsequent question. What would be your treatment of choice and the rationale behind it? And do we have a third part to this question? No, okay. Yeah, Dr. Malik, your thoughts on this. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. So uh, obviously, this is a young and very fit uh, fit patient. Not sure if I'm as fit. So um, so essentially, uh, high risk CLL is the deletion 17P, young and fit, no comorbid illnesses. So obviously, the first question we always ask is, is there any indication for therapy? Does he have constitutional symptoms, bulky disease? Uh, or or, or uh, cytopenias or any other indication. So if there are no indications for treatment, we would still put him on surveillance and then um, keep 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 watching him over. Now, um, if if he develops any of disease uh, therapy related indications for treatment, then we'll obviously look at the options. And we all know individuals with high risk CLL with 17 p deletion would do very poorly with any of chemo or chemo immunotherapy. So we would use targeted agents. And, and the, the choices, again, we have are, are uh, ibrutinib, a calibrutinib as single agent, or combination with obinutuzumab or rituximab, uh, or venetoclax with obinutuzumab. So individually, I would prefer using a single agent uh, uh, BTK inhibitor. And if, if a calibrutinib is available, I would prefer that uh, with regards to better toxicity profile tolerance. 
and perhaps less serious bleeding complications sir so dr malik since he is a fit 52 year old marathon runner would you ever bring up the you know the possibility of talking about a transplant so we uh, so i would say if it does well with with one of these agents i would certainly not consider transplant in first remission and then perhaps wait for him to progress or have have a relapse uh, and then think about it okay so we'll get uh, dr peter's thoughts on this so the same questions to you include including the transplant question dr peter yeah i, I agree i mean I, I, he in he should be treated when he needs treatment because some patients with 17p can go for years without needing therapy so uh, it's, he has got lymphadenopathy so he's likely to go on to to need treatment soon um i prefer again uh, uh indefinite well sort of continuous therapy with a btk inhibitor um I would. We've used ibrutinib in this setting, and I think he's fit. We probably would at the moment until we see the head-to-head -head, uh, trials. Um, in terms of transplant, I would speak to the patient about transplant. I mentioned transplant uh, at the time of starting to treat a patient, but would not consider it as a treatment option now. If he starts to relapse through uh, his BTK inhibitor, then I think you, you then seriously have to consider uh, when the transplant would fit in. Um, usually. If they didn't respond well to venetoxin in second line, the other things that are changing in this group of patients are um, we've actually got two trials open at the moment in, in Leeds for these patients with combinations of a BTK and a BCL2, and so the so that may be an option uh, going forward, and certainly for our patients in trials to stop therapy um, with deep remissions who are seeing deep remissions, and the other development that's happening is CAR T. So so. Although we talk about transplant, and it may be that this sort of patient eventually would 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 end up having an allogeneic transplant because they they may not be uh, controlled by BTK for years and years, um, CAR T may well take over from that. So so delaying the transplant while all these other things are developed, combinations and CAR T is probably sensible. Yeah. So there's one more question on the on the chat box on the same patient. So in in this person would you then consider finite therapy with venetoclax uh, you know because he is high risk and then uh, there's also a cost element which is going to be involved when we are discussing uh, infinite therapy so your thoughts on this dr peter uh, an option of offering venetoclax i think as a person i wouldn't uh, with the data we have at the moment you saw the data um uh in terms of the cl14 where, where the patients are actually relapsing even during the venetoclax 12 months and uh um, a third of patients relapsed by two years. So, so we know in um, the 17p deleted people mutated CLL is, is effectively genetically unstable CLL. That's that's the way I think about it. And so, so they are likely to clonally evolve. And what we really want to do is get is use our best treatment frontline because we know that they become more difficult to treat when they relapse through one line of therapy, regardless of what our therapy is. And so. Treating someone for a year, for example, with Veno, allowing them to relapse a year later, and they're less likely to have a good response to uh, a BTK inhibitor at that point. And, and so I think I would use the best treatment, which I think is a, at the moment for the phase three of BTK monotherapy, although that's why I, 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 for this particular group of patients, I think trials of the combinations is really critical because I think we, if we're getting the majority MLE negative, then, then we have the best chance of having a a prolonged effect on the disease. Uh, so no, I wouldn't use a ven unless the patient was had major issues with with um, with uh, ibuprofen and radicalibrutinib. Uh, and financial may also be an, an issue, I guess, um, as you alluded to. Um, I think if um, if really it's not feasible to have an indefinite use of BTK inhibitor for an individual patient, then then venetoclax ability is might be reasonable. Um, it's better than chemotherapy, certainly, and better than CAMPATH-based treatment. Uh, but half the patients, at least, will not have a very good drug, drug, prolonged remission from that approach. Right. Yeah, in our country, you know, uh, I mean, currently at the cost of a calibrutinib, if you have to give it for one or two years, that would equate the cost of, a, of an allogenic stem cell transplant. So that's where some of these things become a factor when we need to take that uh, call. And that's why I kind of deliberately brought up the transplant issue. Because cost becomes an issue when you need to. Yeah, and I, and I, 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 
I entirely, I mean, if we're, if we're in the fortunate situation uh, that individual cost of the patient is not an issue for us because it's all covered by the health service. I mean, right. sometimes I have problems getting drugs approved. Uh, but I think in the context, if there really was a financial uh, imperative where you couldn't give an indefinite BTK, then, then and, and a transplant was an option, uh, you know, a VEN-based regime to get to remission and then a transplant is a reasonable, is a reasonable option, um, although we don't have a lot of evidence uh, from trials. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. We'll go on to the third case. Uh, this is uh, to Dr. Nataraj. So, Dr. Nataraj, uh, we have a 74-year-old female, uh, BCLL, deletion 11Q, IGHB status unknown, which is pretty common in our country. Uh, again, treated with three cycles of BR and then discontinued due to toxicity. This is again a common phenomenon, which we see people, you know, it's a compliance issue. So they're citing nausea and diarrhea here, uh, got discharged on request. Then again, comes back to the clinic after three months with complaints of B symptoms. So this is a common scenario in our country. Then comes back with a hemoglobin of nine, total count of 55,000, a platelet of 70,000. She's also been a diabetic for about 20 years. So this is how she presents back to the clinic. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide for the questions. So the first question is, what additional diagnostic tests will you recommend when she comes back three months uh, after uh, losing follow-up? Will you reconsider this patient with chemoimmunotherapy, which is either BR or, or whatever else? Uh, if no, would you consider BTKI as treatment of choice and what would you then look at? So Dr. Nataj, these questions are for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me in the meeting. Uh, what additional diagnostic tests will you recommend whenever we restart the patient on treatment, whenever patient comes back with a re-indication, we should always do repeat, we should repeat the FISH and then if available, molecular based uh, 17 deletion tests. And irrespective of whether the patient has got whatever the, whatever the molecular features, I don't think this patient should be treated with chemoimmunotherapy number one. And second thing is I would definitely do an IGHP mutation analysis for this patient. These are the two things which I would do. And uh, third thing is since she has come back with B symptoms, I don't think it is purely immune related. So I think these two things, these two tests I will do. And will you re-challenge this patient with CIT? Unlikely, most likely I will not re-challenge this patient with CIT. Because for two reasons, one is uh, 17 11, 11, deletion 11Q patients will not do very well with chemoimmunotherapy, and second thing is already she has a, she has a she has developed adverse adverse uh, effects which has limited her tra continuation of treatment. Probably even if you use CIT again, she may take for one or two cycles and she may disappear again. And if you consider BTKA, which would be your preference? If cost is not an issue, then acalabrutinib would be a preferred preferred uh, therapy in India. But if cost is a constraint, then I think I would still go ahead with uh, ibrutinib because ibrutinib comes at 20,000 rupees a month cost and then ACAL will come with about 1.2 1, 1 or 1.3 lakhs a month cost. And both are infinite treatments. There is no end to it. Okay, and uh, so I know that there will be a lot of uh, cardiac effects. Yeah. So now I will add two more questions back to Nataraj based on what he has said. So first is you did the IGBH mutation and the mutation came back as mutated. Okay, that's okay. the first scenario. And uh, second, would you be comfortable using uh, generic ibrutinib if you wanted to use it when the patient came back as IGVH unmuted? Sir, irrespective of uh, IGVH mutated or unmutated, maybe this patient would be still, I would still prefer to be started on uh, uh, BTK inhibitor based therapy. And second thing is whether will I use uh, ibrutinib or acal ibrutinib, whether it's generic versus. Uh, the uh, versus the innovator, innovator ibrutinib uh, is as expensive as acal ibrutinib. Of course, if somebody can afford a innovator in a ibrutinib, they can they should be able to afford acal ibrutinib. I would definitely at that point of time I would use acal ibrutinib over ibrutinib for this patient. Generic ibrutinib, yes, it's a good choice because it's about 20% of patients who develop all these side effects with uh, BTK generally ibrutinib. Uh, in, at this at this age, with serious limiting or serious side effects, remaining eighty percent would still go on. So if the, it's better to give something rather than doing nothing, or just re-challenging re this patient on, on uh, chemoimmunotherapy, sir. Right. So now I'll pose the questions to Dr. Peter. So Dr. Peter, what are your thoughts on the additional diagnostic tests when somebody comes back like this, and how would you kind of use that to take a call on the therapy? So I'm going to answer the questions the other way around, if that's all right, Sharak, because uh, I think it's more logical. So. 
Question two, I, I would not ex re-expose this patient to chemotherapy. So she's already okay. failed BR very quickly. Uh, she's had three cycles. And so uh, even, you know, we, we will, I would avoid giving a chemotherapy even frontline, but in this setting, 11 q leads to failed BR, uh, I, I'd go for a targeted treatment. So then the question is, which targeted treatment would you give? Well, you've got, you, I think, uh, on the face of it, you've got the choice of a BTK inhibitor or of an Ethylax rituximab. Uh, would be approved. And so if there are options, uh, if there's still options to the patient, and obviously it depends what's available to the patient, uh, where they are on, from a financial point of view, um, I think then the diagnostic test will, will allow you to choose which of those treatments to, to choose. So if, uh, so let's assume they're both available, a uh, venetoclax or a BTK inhibitor, uh, then if they're 17 p deleted, I would go for a BTK inhibitor without, without a doubt. I think that's, that's fair. If the VH mutated, but not 17P, not previously mutated, then I think a VEN-based regime is reasonable because you're more likely to get a long period of time off treatment, but that she's most likely going to be VH unmutated because she's 11Q deleted and they, they co-segregate. So, so if she's unmutated, I think there's still is a choice between VEN or BTK, and that's a patient choice, uh, um, really, after discussion. Um, in terms of the B which BTK inhibitor, at, at the moment, from the data that's available publicly, you, either are, are reasonable. I don't have any experience with the generic uh, ibrutinib, uh, assuming it's equally effective as, uh, not, as branded ibrutinib, uh, then um, if it's significantly cheaper, then I might go for ibrutinib in, you know, in someone without a cardiac history. She's got diabetes, she has risk factors, she's female, which in our experience is a good thing in terms of toxicity, but cardiac toxicity. So, so I, I mean, I... I think it's reasonable to go with ibrutinib or, or, or acala. Uh, I can't really speak about the trials coming through, but I suspect that might change in the next few months when we see some of the data with the head-to-head -head, uh, comparison. But at the moment, uh, we don't have that data. Um, and so that, that, that would be my, my thoughts, really. Right. So Dr. Peter, are you all routinely doing IGBH mutation testing now at diagnosis in, in all yeah, we, we, it's part of our guidelines, so we would definitely do it before treatment and most patients. Um, it's actually the most useful test after the flow to diagnose CLL at, the, at in stage A disease to define whether the patient's mm -hmm. going to progress to treatment or not. 90% of our patients in our practice present with stage A disease, so it's the biggest group of patients. And when we ask our patients, and we've done this, we surveyed patients in the UK, the most common and most stressful situation is stage A disease the watch and wait, um, because more patients worrying about it. And, and I think there's a, there's a good justification for the mutational status, because if the ones who are mutated, it's reasonable to do less frequent monitoring and to, and to reassure them that most, many patients won't, won't go on to ever need treatment, whereas the unmutated are watch more closely. Um, I, I don't think every patient in the UK gets it, but it is available for, for them. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that input. We'll go on to the, the fourth case. Uh, this is directed to Dr. Satish Siti. Uh, so this is a younger uh, patient, a 38-year-old man, diagnosed uh, uh, one year ago with CLL. Uh, experiences a very rapid elevation in peripheral blood leukocyte numbers, which kind of jump uh, from 20,000 to 2 lakh within the first year. So kind of very aggressive. Spleen, large palpable, occupying the entire left side of the abdomen and, you know, crossing the, onto the right side of the pelvis. He has notable uh, generalized lymphadenopathy. And the patient's prognostic markers indicate an unfavorable prognosis in the form of an unmutated IGBH, as well as trisomy 12. However, he does not have the 17P. Next slide. So the questions which come up are, how will you manage this patient, a young fellow? Uh, we're moving away from the usual elderly patient. Would you consider finite treatment or treatmental progression? And how would you kind of fit this in? If you have the option of chemoimmunotherapy, BTK and BCL2, what would be your choice and why? And like I mentioned earlier, would you even start considering a possible transplant for this particular patient, Dr. Satish? Thank you, sir, uh, having me as a panelist. Uh, sir, like this case, sir, definitely is uh, progressing very fast and unfavorable uh, markers are there, uh, molecular marker. Like um, except uh, 17 uh, P deletion, like uh, this case definitely is a pro clinically progressing and massive spinal is a request a treatment. One uh, one of the treatment like is there a chemo immunotherapy? Mm -hmm. This is the decision. 
because young fellow like i'll try to go for fcr is one of the option i'll try to go like is a fit person i try to go like one of the final tr- treatment i'll try to try is a patient like <clears throat> like i'll try to see the like uh, if there anything is a like, progression is a definitely i'll try to um, consider for the because uh, the, the btk is one of the option is a day one i will discuss with them but only thing is mm-hmm. like so but the cost of uh, cost of the treatment for like uh, now generics are there but the patient is not willing to continue the treatment at all for at least a disease progression i'll try to consider a couple of cycle of care as a regimen and try to have a mental therapy that's what so would you bring up the option of uh, venetoclax based finite therapy also in this particular setup uh yes sir like definitely i want to consider sir The only thing is personal experience of uh, okay. uh, using also yeah yes sir yeah go ahead go ahead so personal experience of beat like uh, mentoclax is i am not expert except aml i one of the patient we have combined we got done but then uh, cl we got i feel you know, i could not able to use it okay okay btk okay. inhibitor i definitely have except uh, uh, calamity calamity yes right. and would you also possibly then consider him you know keeping a backup plan for stem cell transplant you know keeping yeah, hla typing and yeah, all that yeah uh, definitely so i'll keep this patient uh, i'll try to assess the response to the like uh, some day after the, uh, the patient recover btk inhibitor some point of time i'll because the patient is very young like uh, requires a like uh, unfavorable prognosis factor is definitely i'll try to keep as a stem cell transplant is one of the option you uh, know because the problem is issue with the continuation because uh, you know, generics i can able to go ibrutinib in, in, but some point of time even even may progress on this one also but i don't think the patient is able to offer all for acular to be definitely i may keep the option otherwise stem cell is a one of the concern day one i'll be expand because uh, like a patient will do the, the way is a this progression is happening from the uh, first within first year is progressing fast mm. he'll respond to the uh, treatment or like uh, whatever the treatment you choose but We have to see the how durable response the patient is doing to well, but some point of point of, uh, point of the time the patient requires a stem cell transplant. That's so one of the thing family will be concerned from the day one. That's what is my side. So. Okay, right, uh, Doctor Peter. If this patient was in the UK, how would you kind of uh, manage this patient? This patient is to me a very worrying patient. So uh, much worse than the other ones. I mean, he's a young gentleman. He's got extremely proliferative disease. He's he's got a doubling time of around three months from twenty to two hundred. He's got massive spleens. He's got very bulky disease. Um, you know, we know that from our from our studies and, and others that there's a s- small proportion of patients that really have bad bad risk CLL or complex carrier type. Uh, you know, or very proliferative. And this is the sort of patient we tend to see who are like that. I also worry a little bit more about trisomy twelve. I know in the in the in the in the, in the trials it's not. a majorly bad thing but you know the bad things happen to I've seen one or two patients with trisomy 12 that have done badly so i think he's one that i would be really anxious about um in view of the the proliferative nature of disease and the bulk disease i would in the first instance go with a btk inhibitor with him i think he's got very proliferative disease um i would worry that and I'd want to be certain that he had cell or not mantle cells just to make sure that he doesn't have and you know a, a more aggressive lymph nodes disease right. um probably not with the trisomy 12 but 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 I would I would certainly want to know that he didn't have 1114 and 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 mm. he was uh, type and D1 not 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 um translocated so let's say he isn't um i have a slight anxiety with the ven veno would be the treatment it would be approved in the UK for him but the chance of him going into a complete remission with no palpable disease uh, spleen normal would be pretty small probably because most if you look at the the studies that we don't have the entirely comparable data but at 9 months with VR in Murano many patients have low bulk lymph nodes still and and it takes longer for the disease to go down under control so so I'd favor BTK but I would also think that he is likely to fail um sooner or later um and we would be thinking of transplant is 38 so you know he's not you know he, he's you know, 10 years in remission is not good enough for him um you know yeah. it might be if, you, if you're 80 so um i'd be talking to him about that i think he's a sort of patient 
where combination therapies would in the future be approached uh, likely to be beneficial you know btk plus pclt i wouldn't go near chemotherapy with him um and maybe even the car t in the eventually but uh he's a very he's what he, he would worry me uh ngs might help so we do hyperbysing panels on our patients which includes t53 but also about 23 other genes lymphoid genes and if you see multiple mutations then that would be a worry because he's already clonally diversifying and evolving already before he's treated. So, so yeah, this is one of the ones that would worry me. <laughs> right. So, I mean, just to add another thing, so if he had a mad sibling donor, would you kind of go the allergenic transplant route or would you still look at CAR T cell therapy prior to that? No, I think, I, think, I think what I would do in that situation is I would give him a BTK because he may well respond well. And if he does, that's his best option at the moment. If he doesn't respond well to that or fails that, then I think uh, I would go f at the moment for allergenic transplant. So we, we you know, CAR T's are a challenge uh, now in CLL. We, we've just got some some data with Lysacel. The other two products, we don't get T cells from them. So I think, and we know that the only curative treatment we have thus far is, is an allergenic transplant. If he's got, even in a, same with a sibling, but even with an unrelated donor, if he's failed a BTK and he's got a well-matched donor, uh, I would go for a VEN-based uh, combination next. If he's MRD negative, I think you can then discuss whether you don't do a transplant, you watch him. If he's MRD positive at the end of a VENR, then I think he's destined to relapse and should be transplanted at that point. Um, and then CAR-T can be reserved for later on if, if needed. Hopefully it won't be needed. Uh, but I think, you know, he's 1% he's of our CLL patients probably, but he's a worrying 1%. Right. Right, right. Yeah. So we won't waste more time on this. Uh, we may have time for just one last little case. I think, yes, we have about three minutes left. So the last case, I'll give it to Dr. Ashish Dixit, who's done the discussion so far. So this is a 72-year-old male, uh, active lifestyle, diagnosed BCLL. Uh, he's got palpable adenopathy. Uh, five years after his diagnosis, develops bulky adenopathy with uh, larger lymph nodes. And uh, total count of 45,000 fish is deletion 11Q. Treated with six cycles of BR, then treatment stopped when clinically visible disease disappears. He tolerates it well, counts have reduced. And four months after the last cycle, his hemoglobin platelets have normalized. Now, eight years later, when he's 80 year old from his original diagnosis, he comes back with similar signs of bulky adenopathy. So, Ashish, your thoughts on this uh, before we quickly wrap up? Uh, again, we'll go by the basics again. We'll need to do a fish test and then check whether he has the same phenotype or not in terms of the same genotype. In fact, it is deletion 11Q. In case I need to use, I'll still prefer to use, if it is 17P deletion negative, I'll prefer to use uh, BTK inhibitor-based therapy because the main problem here is mainly the bulky nodes that are mainly prompting the patient for the therapy if the counts are fine. Mm. So that will be the preferred mm. way to go. Uh, in case mm. he needs therapy, symptomatic and bulky adenopathy is the main reason. Right. So, Dr. Okay. Peter, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think well, he's had, he's had a, we don't, we don't like, I don't personally like BR in CLL. So, so I tend to use FCR or Columbus Lubinities in the days where now we can actually have targeted treatment. For this particular patient, um, he's had a very long remission after BR. Um, he had eight years uh, off treatment. So, he's probably reasonably good risk uh, in, 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 that, in those terms because that's, twice as long or more than twice as long as, as the average. I think you could make, you could certainly make a case for venetoclax based treatment because, uh, you know, there's a reasonable chance you'd have two years of VENR and then more than two years off treatment if you achieved MLE negativity. So I think it's a discussion for the, for between you and the patient as to uh, what approach he, he, want, he wants. The only concern I'd say at the moment with COVID, it, it's a, it leans me towards a BTK, but if you took COVID out of the equation uh, and, and it, we didn't went in that era, then I think a Venar is a reasonable approach to someone like him. Yeah. So, Doctor Peter, your thoughts on the toxicity of Venar? Because I mean, we don't seem to have used too much of it. Most of us are being comfortable using ibrutinib. So, is it a very toxic regimen in the elderly? The the Venetoclax? Oh. But no, it's, it isn't. The issue, the issue is the tumor lysis, but that's manageable. Um, we, we only see two or three percent of patients. We've used a lot of it. When you get experienced, 
you're using it, you can. It's not that difficult to do. It just means a lot of visits to hospital in the first month. That's the challenge. Uh, and actually, in terms of the ongoing toxicity, that you don't see the ibrutinib nuisance side effects. You see a bit of a bit of diarrhea, a bit of flatulence sometimes, and you see a little bit of neutropenia, particularly with the CD20, but that usually GCF responsive. So, so that, no, I don't think there's a major issue with toxicity. Okay, right. Great. I think thank you so much for your uh, time and all your inputs, Dr. Peter and all the panelists. Uh, I think we're just bang on time. Uh, we'll end the discussion here and I'll uh, hand it back to the chairperson. Thank you so much.